Good morning. In, um, in Psalm 27, it's called Fearless Faith. I had faith there that it was going to get quiet, but maybe I was um, perhaps too much. It says, now teach me all about your ways and tell me what to do. Make it clear for me to understand, for I am surrounded by waiting enemies. Don't let them defeat me, Lord. You can't let me fall into their clutches. They keep accusing me of things I've never done, while they plot evil against me. Yet I totally trust you to rescue me once more, so that I can see once again how good you are while I'm still alive. Here's what I've learned through it all. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave and courageous and never, never lose hope. Yes, keep on waiting, for he will never disappoint you. Father, we thank you that we can gather here this morning to be in your presence. We pray for fearless faith. We pray for an outpouring this morning of patience to wait upon you and what you are to do in our lives. We pray that we will be brave and courageous. And most of all, we pray that we will never lose hope. For you, we know, will never disappoint us in all that you do. Amen. We're going to sing three songs this morning before the, uh, the young people go out. Um, during the second of those songs, I'd ask for the offering to be taken up. Um, so if you'd like to stand, and we'll, we'll get started.
Thank you that we are able to gather and bring our offerings to you, not just in terms of money, but in terms of the gifts that you have given to us, the gifts you have called us to use for you. And we ask that you will take our gifts, our giving, and all that we are to use them in your service, Father. Now and in the coming weeks, take our lives, Lord, and help us to find ways that we may serve you in all that we do. Amen.
Father, we just thank you that we're able to sing those words and know that they are true, that you are with us, you have given your son that we might find salvation, that at Calvary the price was paid, the deed was sealed. And we ask, Father, that we will remember that and that we will have fearless faith as we go forth. Now it's time for the young people to go to their classes. And I'm going to hand over to Bob for a moment. That wasn't your phone going, was it? No, it's okay. <laughs> Thankfully, not. Is that going to be up there? Prophecy. Staring at me. Yes? Can we stick the prophecy up? Is that there? It's okay. It's all right. I've got it here. No, you got it. All right. Um, this is the time when we're just going to be sharing and testimonies and stuff. So I thought I, would, I, w- I wanted to do this for two reasons. This was a prophecy that a good friend of ours sent to us last August. And it's two things to teach you is that sometimes prophecy takes a while to, to come into fruition. And uh, two, I, I really believe it's, it's for us as this church. And uh, so as I said, it was sent last August, so that's over a year ago. And Stuart said to me, <laughs> he said, it's only five o'clock and God is showing me that the people of West and Supermare are on his heart. And then he said, I thought I had far more pressing matters to think about and pray about this morning than the people of Weston. But then he goes on to say, there are pockets of downtrodden in in the community that feel that they have been abandoned by man and by God. And God is going to lead you to that community to them, uh, and lead your community to them, sorry. Yes, it may be in the first instance, providing food and clothing. They have rarely been shown an act of genuine kindness. Mistrust is huge. Your community over time with considerable patience will penetrate cold-hearted indifference to see them one for the Lord. They will, be, uh, they will be hard work and you will waver from time to time, but God is faithful to you and to your flock and to those who are crying out to him. This will be no ordinary outreach. You will come across these people one by one. Different people bef- will befriend the downtrodden. Not a high profile concentrated effort, but low key, and you will become aware of the needs of these people as the Lord lays them on your heart. Maybe 20 in all, not that many in global terms, but precious in the eyes of God. So when you hear, feed my sheep, watch out for this community around you and reaching and start to reach these lost souls. He said, I believe God will alert you to these people as you pray for your community. Significant personal growth will take place in people within your church as the Lord asks them to show Christ like love to these people. My email is a God prompt to say that this is about to happen in your fellowship. It is not an announcement at the front that you're going to undertake a human project um, in your local area. It's going to be a sovereign work of God. And he's calling you and Sue to shepherd this move of God, bathed in prayer so that uh, your church will embrace these people for the season that God is bringing into your lives. Now, I should know better, shouldn't I? Uh, It is there, okay. I should know better because Sue's main gifting is prophecy. But generally when Stuart sends me stuff like that, I read it politely and I think, well, that's interesting and I kind of, I'll think about that one later because the day is busy. But this was pre-Becky standing up and saying, who wants to come and help me and come out and and go out with the bigger picture with uh, Claire's church, Vintage. And... uh, This is pre-vintage then finding out that Claire was going to go to America and has since handed over the bigger picture ministry to us as a church. And the more I go out with the people and we go and feed uh, the homeless on a Sunday night, the more I realize that Stuart was so, so right. And uh, we need to listen to that and we need to operate that. The more I see some of our church being involved in street pastors, the more I see some of us involved in the food bank, the more I see some of us involved in CAP, then I realize this is something that God is truly, truly calling us to do. And um, Angela, she can't make it today, but she's left me some paper. 
So we will be, you know, it's just a, an asking you to sign up. If you've already signed up, 19 of us, I think, are already signed up for the bigger picture to go out and help the, to feed uh, the homeless on a Sunday night. There's another group of people who are saying that they're willing to maybe make up the sandwiches, etc., so that they can come. Um, so before I go, but at the end of the service, I'll rush in and we'll get the, the sheets so that you can sign up for these things. I really think it's, it is a sovereign act of God. It isn't something that we would intrinsically think, oh, that's a great idea, let's do that, because it is hard work. But the more I go out there, I realize that this is what God is wanting us to do, because it's, we're giving them Jesus. There are non-Christians out there today who are going to be giving them Chinese takeaways, Indian takeaways, and all the leftovers from Greg's. And I know that if I was on the street, I would prefer the Indian takeaway or the Chinese takeaway rather than a sandwich and a bottle of water. But what we're giving them is the opportunity for people to sit down and listen to the story and pray with them. And uh, is James here? Okay, right, that's fine. The look I've got, Matt. I love these people. <laughs> Make me look good. Um, um, but James met a lady called Karen last Saturday night when he was doing street pastoring. And she, she's not in a good way. We met her again on, on the Sunday afternoon. And she was going into rehab on the Monday and I, we prayed that she would go into rehab. She is in rehab now. And that is great that she's going through that, that situation. That was the lady that some of you will see on social media that James asked for a whole load of stuff. We got it <coughs> twice over. And we've got stuff. So we've got a heart for that. So these are the people God is putting us in contact with. These are the people that, you know, God wants us to love unconditionally and bring in. And... Um, just on the thing of prophecy, on Monday I was at a leaders meeting and this guy who is, he's a Ghanaian, but he's a pastor now in Canada, sort of picked a few of us out and he said a few things about me, uh, but the one thing he said is that he's going to provide us with a building. I thought, that's nice. And you know, I know that Clive and some of the others are thinking, wouldn't it be great to have a presence in the town center? Yeah? Because we're just a little bit far out, aren't we? We're a bit in the suburbs. But wouldn't it be great to have a presence in the town center where Jesus is just there, a community center there? So I'm up for that. I'm believing in that. He didn't say you will buy one, which was good. He didn't say, he said he will give you one. And so I'm, I'm, I'm up for believing for that. Are you? Okay, let's pray. Come on, Paul, you're up for believing that, aren't you? Because you're coming on next anyway. You want to lead us in prayer for believing for that building and for the ministry. Oh, sorry, I've got it. Okay. Um, just the other thing to say, actually, is that if you watch BBC Points West tomorrow, mm. no, I don't know when it's going to be, but one other thing to pray about is that BBC Points West are going to be at the food bank in Weston all day tomorrow. Um, with Clive and team. I think they wanted a particular slant on things, but Clive is trying to give a different story, so maybe we could pray about that as well. So let's just pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, huh, when we say Heavenly Father, we're remembering that you are our Father, that you are in heaven. And you want to bless us with heaven. And you know all the needs of people in Western, and you've got a plan. Mm. And we rejoice in that, Lord. We praise you for that. And we thank you for these words that you've given some last year that are coming to fruition already. Yeah. Because when you speak, it happens. So, Lord, bring your word to f full fruition. Yeah. Yeah. And, Lord, we pray this building and this presence into place, in the center, into the heart of Weston. And we pray that you provide that absolutely the way that you want it to be, Lord, whatever that might be. Yeah. And that we would see you at work and know that it's you. Lead us and guide us and prompt us. So that that presence may spread out. 
and the presence of Jesus might be known, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in lives. And Lord, we pray for those handful of people that are being touched at the moment as people go out on a Sunday evening and meet those people out on the streets. Lord, in that prophecy, it was that it would just be a handful, and they are your people. You love them. They're made in your image, whatever they look like at the moment, whatever their lives are like at the moment, and we pray restoring and healing and blessing. We pray that the groups and the people that go out would speak your name boldly and clearly and share you in a way that touches them and brings them to you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray for the food bank and the fact that they're going to be on the telly. Lord, we know that can be a blessing yeah. and it can be a curse. Lord, we pray that it would be a blessing. Yeah. We pray that tomorrow Clive and the team would present the story that they want to present and that would be the story that comes out in that article, whenever it may be. Mm -hmm. And that, again, your kingdom come, your will be done in that situation. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <coughs> and you, you carry on um, as you know, there's a, a group of us who meet every third Sunday. Um, just up there, you're very welcome to come and join us. That, by the way, is a representation of the burning bush and we switch that on again today just remembering God's presence wherever we go and we got a real sense this morning that there are there's at least one maybe more than one person here in this building right now overwhelmed by anxiety or at least touched by anxiety in a particular way and that God wants to touch you and meet with you right now. We had some words. Psalm 139. Let me get the right verses. 16 and 17. Just wanting to speak into this situation of anxiety. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. And also in Isaiah 57, we read about restoring the crushed spirit, a comfort for those who mourn. And there may be someone here mourning the loss of something, not necessarily someone. And Sarah's going to come and join us in a minute, I think, to say something. Um, and then from Isaiah 55 as well, just to speak into these situations, come, all of you who are thirsty, Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. It may mean there's someone here worried about their financial situation. Come, buy, eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Listen to me. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. Do you want to add something to that? A few weeks ago when um, Daniel Black was here, um, I had that picture of somebody who was feeling trapped and, and inside a cage and, and there was a real sense of sort of terror and, and that picture hasn't left me. Um, I've been reflecting on it a lot because nobody responded at the time. And then James Watton came and spoke to me a few weeks ago, a week or so ago saying that... Um, he had that morning a real sense of somebody anxious, but how the Lord wanted to deliver them from it. And he had a real physical sense of birthing pains. So that from Psalm 139 about being in the womb and coming, coming out of it. 
but I shared with Nikki on um, Tuesday that um, I also had a really strong sense that whoever this person is, they, God wants them to just rest the way that God um, took Jonah on that journey because he was going in the wrong direction and sat under a tree and just rest and receive the Holy Spirit. As I was sitting over there thinking, Lord, what do we do with these words? I actually felt that, and, and this is really hard, <laughs> that we should just pause for a moment. And if there is anyone feeling anxious about anything, that you don't share it. But if you have just got a fear or a worry or an anxiety, that you maybe just indicate that to one or two people around you and that we just take a moment to pray for each other. I know there's at least one person in this room with a big operation coming up that's going to affect their lifestyle for at least six weeks and that that person just needs some support and help um, Kathleen needs a bit of prayer so there's one person but I'm just wondering whether you could maybe just indicate to people around you so we're just going to pause for a second and if any of you feel just a little bit of anxiety about anything at all that you just share it in the sense that I'm just, I've got to worry. Don't need to say any more than that. And then that we just support each other with the prayer for a moment. So I'm going to step back a sec. Just if you feel able to indicate that you want some prayer or something that's making you anxious, just let people around you know. And we'll just pray around you and with you. Don't be afraid to say anything or indicate or chat. Okay, so if, if anyone has indicated anyway, if you want to put a hand up or you just want to say something, just would you pray for me? And then let's lay hands on those people and let's speak these words into being. Lord Jesus, thank you that your love casts out all fear. And we pray now that you would come afresh by your spirit. And as these people come to you, that you would cast out that fear, cast out that anxiety and that worry. If there's anyone here crushed, Lord, or weighed down, that you would lift them up again and take that weight off them. That you would comfort them and restore them and bring healing and release. Folks, as this is happening, don't worry about emotion being expressed. It's just someone coming to the Lord and being touched. It's absolutely fine. Let's just keep praying and resting and letting God work. Lord, we thank you for your healing and we thank you for your loving presence. Thank you for your blessing. And we pray, Lord, that you completely heal and restore.
Gott. One other thing, Tim and Michelle are going through. Can I just... We're not yeah. here today, but those of you who have been here a lot longer, you know that Oliver, you know, when he got meningitis as a, as a, a young child, and it's, it's all coming to a head now, it's all coming to all the meetings, and, you know, hopefully it won't go to court, but, it, you know, if it, if it doesn't get resolved in the next few weeks, it will go to the High Court in London. And uh, he's been talking to me about that recently, and I just said we would pray as a family. And uh, we just want justice for Oliver, and we want peace for, for the whole, for mum and dad, and, you know, obviously Emma, who's the mum, and, uh, and the children that are in that household, because there's a real stress, or potential stress can be there. So let's just pray. Father, we, I just thank you for Tim. Uh, we thank you for Oliver. We love, we love Oliver dearly here. Um, Father, we know that uh, there just has to be a just um, resolution on that, that situation. Uh, as a dad, his heart is saying that I can look after Oliver just now, but there will come a time when we'll not be able to look after Oliver because we will not be here. And so he just wants to have that assurance and the financial security that Oliver will be taken care of after receiving this, uh, this, this meningitis years ago. So Father, we just pray for a just and true um, settlement in this case, that both sides will come to an agreement and it won't need to go to uh, the, the, the high courts in London and that it will be resolved easily uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, we also want to pray for the young lady that Sue and I have been meeting in the last couple of weeks down at the hospital in San Bay. Uh, and she is one who has just got so, so, many, so much stuff going on. We thank you, Father, that... Uh, you know, through our conversations that she's going to do away with the Ouija board. She's going to do away with listening to the evil one. And she's starting to listen to what you have to say to her. So we pray for a complete breakthrough for a young lady called Rachel. And that she will be able to, to be able to leave hospital. She'll be able to go back to York to be with her children and start a life again afresh with you in Jesus' name. Thank you for these people. Although they're not here, these words were for them as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the way that you embrace us all, wherever we are, whatever's happening in our lives. And we thank you for the embrace of your love this morning, the way that you are touching and have been touching us. And we open our hearts and our minds to you afresh as you continue to touch us through the rest of this morning. We thank you for your love and your peace. And we just pray that over us all now. And your restoring and your healing. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Wrong one. There we go. That's better. Thank you for that time of worship there, Brandon. He is a good, good father. What do good dads do? They get rid of the stuff for their children, don't they? Uh, sometimes, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to allow God to be God and get rid of the stuff to free us up. So let's start with the words of Jesus. So we pray first. Father, we just don't want to hear Jesus' words and just have them just as words. We're saying, come Holy Spirit, and make them alive. We want these words of Jesus to speak directly to our hearts. We want them to change us. We want them to transform us. Because we want to be a people who have been transformed by you, who will go and start to see transformation in our town, in our, in our county, and in our nation. We believe that you are a good, good father because that's who you are and that we are loved by you and that's who we are. So Father, we just say, speak these words of Jesus into our hearts so that we can be changed forevermore this morning and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 18, verses nine to 14. It says, then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else, for I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted." For those of us a certain age, this is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. If you read a more modern translation of the Bible, sometimes it says it's just about two, a story of two men praying. Um, But whether or not, which one you have, it's, it's another parable that needs rescuing. It's another one that is not just a simple story about prayer and how to pray. There is a lot more to it than that. It is a story of a Pharisee and a tax collector. It's a story about a man who was a religious man. And it's a story of a man who was uh, deemed as as a sinner in in the eyes of most of the people around him. And the Pharisee, the religious man, stands up and he prays this arrogant prayer. And he is absolutely hammered for it by Jesus, for his attitude. But the tax collector, it says he can barely stand up. He can barely lift his eyes up to heaven. And it says he beats his chest and uh, he prays humbly, and he is praised for doing so. Um, but too often when you get studies of this, this, uh, this, this passage, too often when I've heard people sort of maybe even preaching on it, um, what comes out is we say, thank God I'm not like the Pharisee. But the minute you say, thank God I'm not like the Pharisee, you have become the Pharisee. Because you're saying, thank God I'm not like that man. And so it, there's, there's more to it than that. There was a story I, I listened to, to somebody preaching, and he told the story when he was a young pastor just setting off. He had this um, elderly lady in his church who was mentoring him, and uh, they used to meet every week to pray. And he started, and the young pastor started the prayer, and he said, Father, I thank you for keeping me humble. And he said, within seconds, he said he felt this pain in his side from the elderly lady saying, you are now going to pray and ask God to forgive you for your pride in your humbleness. You see, it's, it's a bit about prayer, but it, the focus of this story is on righteousness. The focus is all about righteousness. Verse nine, let's read it again. He said, Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. 
What did it mean to be righteous in these days? What did it mean to be righteous in the days of Greek and Hellenistic culture? The word that they used there was actually a civilized man, someone who observed the customs, somebody who obeyed the law, you know, a nice neighbor, somebody you could trust on. This is what they were doing. But that is not what righteousness meant in the New Testament. It's about a person, it's about a community that meet, you know, that who have in a special relationship with God. Oops, second one. Oh, go back one. It's not going. Anyway, I'm going to read you 2, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For God made Jesus, Christ Jesus, who never sinned to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right. In other words, righteous with God through Christ. There we are. We've got it now. Where's that picture? It's disappeared. Anyway, that picture was the one in pictures. It just says, you know what? God took on all our rubbish, and that's me being polite, so that we could receive his righteousness. There you are. And Jesus, there was the bottom one. He was punished. Jesus, he punished Jesus for my sin, but he treated me as if I had lived his life. That is what righteousness is there in the picture there. And uh, it's nothing to do with what we do. And what I often say to people is, unfortunately, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we see all the rubbish, don't we? No? Oh, I got one nod of the head. Thank you. There's two of us. There's two of us that see the rubbish in our lives. And that is an absolute lie from the pit of hell. Because if you have accepted Jesus Christ into your life, then you should see yourself the way God the Father sees you. How many of you have been parents or been uncles or aunts or been mentors and, you know, you've got this sobbing wreck in front of you, and you say, that's not who you are. You know, as a dad, you go and tell them who they are, how amazing they are, how they're going to get on in life, and how they're going to do this, this, and this. But they can just see the rubbish. God, when he looks at you, sees you through the eyes of Jesus. God sees you. The Father sees you through the cross. So when he looks at Bob Mackay and he sees all the rubbish that Bob Mackay said this week, all the rubbish that Bob Mackay did, when the, the accuser comes and points at Bob Mackay and he goes up to God the Father, God the Father says, I can only see Bob Mackay through the cross. And we need to learn to see ourselves through the cross. That doesn't mean to say that, you know, we're perfect. We're not perfect. But we need to see ourselves the way God sees us. And he sees us as loving uh, his loving children that he loves unconditionally, that his son died on the cross for us. We need to see ourselves that way. And then when we go out into the streets and we're walking past people who are in a sleeping bag in the middle of our town centers, when we see people shooting themselves with stuff in their arms and taking drugs, we need to see them the way God the Father sees them. We do not, they do not need another pair of condemning eyes and judgmental eyes on them. They have got enough of that. They probably guilt-ridden themselves without you and I adding to that. We need to, A, see ourselves the way God sees us, and B, see other people the way God sees them. Because there would be a less judgmental community, a less judgmental church, if we could see each other the way God sees them. Because when you judge somebody, God says, wait a minute, my son died for him. He's my child. Leave me to deal with him. You get on with your own stuff. That's how he does it. We need to learn that our sin is nailed to the cross. Past, present, future is nailed to the cross. We are forgiven and we are seen as righteous. I remembered uh, Maxine's phone number from last week, about three days later. And I sent the email to a certain person and I said, I feel righteous now because I've remembered the phone number. That doesn't make me righteous. Maybe three days late. <laughs> you see, self-made righteousness has absolutely nothing to do with you being righteous. Whether you're a good person, moral standing in the community, you obey the laws of the land, it gets worse. Whether you attend church, whether you read your Bible, whether you pray, Jesus was saying here, it is nothing to do with that. He said, it's all to do with me. And then it's in verse, here we go, I'm, out, I'm all out of sync now, aren't I? But the tax collector stood at distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, 
be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. When you realize your need for Jesus and you ask him into your life, that's when you become righteous in their sight. See, this parable was a long, a long list, a long line of parables that Jesus was teaching in response to the Pharisees saying, this guy hangs about with sinners too much. What he were, they were basically saying, they should be hanging around with us. We are the righteous ones. We are the church go in their day. We are the churchgoers. He should be hanging around with us, not these miserable sinners, not these terrible people. Because you see, the good, righteous people of Jerusalem of their day was fully expecting God to come and denounce the sinners. But Jesus is crying out to them in all of these parables, and he's saying to them, I have come for them. You're condemning them. You're judging them. But I have come for them. And he's actually saying more. He's saying in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to be nailed on that cross for them. And yet you condemn them, and you judge them. You see, in all of these parables, and we're going to do one in a couple of weeks' time, the rich man and Lazarus, whose side was God on? Lazarus. And then we've done the one of the persistent widow in prayer. Whose side was he on? He was on the widow. And then there's this one here where people still feel good about themselves, still, and even the fact that they've rejected Jesus, they feel superior, they feel righteous. And there's the tax collector. Whose side's he on? The tax collector. The one who says, you know, oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Jesus was going, cutting right across popular belief of what it meant to be a righteous person. And he was saying, it's not about being a decent chap who, who cuts his lawn at the right time and never makes a noise and doesn't have parties at the wrong time. It's about his relationship with me. It's about his relationship with me. He was saying it's not about any of that. Righteousness is from God and from God only. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says that God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. And then Isaiah sorry. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those. That's the wrong one. It's number six. That was my fault. I'll read it to you. When it says, when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. They are nothing but filthy rags in the eyes of God. Let's go back to what it is again. Luke, 8, Luke 18, verse 9. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. His message on his day caused an, an offense because he was telling them that their righteousness doesn't depend on the things that they do. Their righteousness depends on their relationship with God. It caused that offense 2,000 years ago, and that offense caused the religious people to kill him and put him on the cross and kill him. It led him to be crucified. The Pharisees, the teachers, couldn't hear that, that, that teaching, and so they crucified him. And it is still an offense today. It is still an offense today. The cross is an offense today. There are the Pharisees in our church today. They will not call themselves Pharisees, but they will have a whole list of things that you have to do, that you have to say. And do you know what? It is chasing away the tax collectors, the sinners, the people who say, I can't reach that level. I can't, I can't look like you. I can't speak like you. I'm not educated like you are. I cannot be a follower of Jesus. And it's chasing them away from, from the, the churches. But there's nothing to do with rules and regulations. We need to realize that righteousness, Jesus was saying, was all about him. It's all about him. The early disciples, they weren't great shakes, were they? They were, they were a right bunch of just ordinary people with lots of faults and stuff. But yet... We have now gone back sometimes to this Greek Hellenistic approach where we want people to do, to behave in a certain way. 
In churches, you will see we have to believe, behave, and then belong. And I would want to tell you that's wrong. We need to belong, believe, and then behave. And there are churches where they say, you know, when they believe, you have to say these certain words. And when you've said these certain words, then you can believe. And then it gets to the stage, now we need to stop all this stuff that you're doing because you have to learn to behave now. I mean, it's interesting in church history, isn't it? Over the last 10, 20, 30, whatever it is, years. Drinking's okay now. Have you noticed that? It's all right. <laughs> Used to be back in the day, you know, you didn't smoke and they didn't drink. Smoking is still deemed on as not being very good. I always laugh. I haven't, I don't think any, I haven't caught any of you smoking. That's good, isn't it? But, uh, you know, in a previous church, I'd be walking through the high street and somebody would see me go, <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> you're you're right, you're right, you're right. You know, and I thought, for goodness sake, just stick the cigarette in your mouth, and I know you smoke, I can smell it in your clothes, you know, but it's this, oh, and he's caught me smoking. And, you know, we say, until you clean up your whole life, and we'll tell you the bits that you have to clean up, because you sin differently than us. We sin, but our sin's okay. <laughs> our sin's okay, but you sin differently, and so you have to stop doing this, stop doing that, stop saying this. There's a colleague, a friend of a guy that I know who's in the north of England, and he's had to have a list where he works in real tough inner city church, and he has to have a list of acceptable swear words in church, because that's where they've come from. They have no clue. They're just, it's, it just comes out every other word. They don't even know they're using these words. They don't know that they offend certain people. They just use these words. So they've had to come up with a list that some of them are okay. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you which ones are okay and which are not okay, okay? <laughs> but he had to come up with a list. Nobody taught him that at theological college, that you would be in a church where you had to come up with a list of which were acceptable swear words. And that's because we don't do what we should do, and that is they need to learn to belong first. And after they belong, they believe and then after they believe, they start getting the behavior into say, I'm still learning to behave. So are you. In case you didn't know what I'm telling you, you are. But when we get these people and they come off of the street, and maybe one will come here, maybe they'll smell a little bit. Maybe they'll smell of the, the cider they've been drinking the night before. Maybe they're injecting themselves. Are we going to say, you belong? Or are we going to say, you can't come in here until you believe and then you behave and then we'll let you belong? You see, the Pharisees couldn't cope with Jesus hanging around with the wrong people. And there's some people who are earning six-figure salaries who are also the wrong people. And they wouldn't want you hanging around with them either because they're sinners. We're all sinners. Our righteousness comes through knowing Jesus and nothing else. You see, the Pharisee was a good man. He didn't rob banks. He wasn't committing adultery. These are quite decent qualities in a person, aren't they? He fasted twice a week. He gave a tenth of his income every week. When I was reading that, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if the worldwide church fasted twice a week and gave a tenth, I reckon we would eradicate poverty. But he wasn't condemned for that. He was condemned for trusting in his own righteousness. See, the message of being justified by faith is still an offense today. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then in, and then in Ephesians, sorry, let's go on here. And then in Ephesians 2, 10, he says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You see, doing good things doesn't get us saved but we are saved to do good things. We are not saved just to sit in a pew and come back the following week and then sit in a pew and come back the few. We are saved to do good things. John Kirby, the chief exec of CAP, 
was asked in the BBC documentary a couple of weeks ago. And if you don't know CAP, do the, uh, they've, they've got so many people off of uh, uh, being, being in debt. And they said, do you think this will get you to heaven? And he said, no. He said, my faith will get me to heaven because he has been saved to do good works. We still live in a culture that if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. And do you know why I know that? Because from time to time, I take funerals. And I watch them watching me. And I have never been to a non-Christian funeral where they didn't think that granny or granddad was going to heaven. Don't believe in God. Don't believe in, you know, the, all that stuff. That granny was a good woman and she'll be in heaven. And, she'll be, and they say it in the tributes. She'll be looking down on us now. And I also look out into their faces, desperate to hear words of hope that it's true. But we live in a society that says, you're righteous because of the good things that you do. We need to learn to be intentional. We need to do these good deeds. We are not the arm of social services. We need to make that clear. What we do is being intentional for Jesus. So everything that we do is intentional for Jesus. When we go out this afternoon and we give out sandwiches, we give out one sandwich, crisps, a biscuit or something, um, water and a piece of fruit. There are non-Christians who go out and give Chinese takeaways, give Indian takeaways. They've got contracts with the takeaway companies and Greg's. If I was on the street, that's the one I would want. It's all right, I'm nearly finished. <laughs> but what we want to do is being intentional about Jesus so that these people know that we are, we are saying these things or we are doing these things because Jesus first loved us. Does that make sense? None of you are doing this. Clive is not doing the food bank so that he can sort of, you know, earn his salvation. The guys going out in the street pastoring are not doing that to earn their salvation. Those who are doing the coffee stop are not doing it to earn their salvation. Those who do the community lunch are not doing it to earn their salvation. It is because we've experienced God's love that we now give it out to somebody else. Finish with a story from Cap. This is why Cap is so successful. They do not take money from government because they want to go into the house and the first thing, and I hope, is there anybody here who's a cat visitor? Not today. We have some. The first thing they say is, we've experienced God's love and we believe that God loves you too. And we believe that God loves you enough and so much that he wants you to get out of this debt. In our previous church, I baptized more people through the cap scheme than any other way that came to faith. Why? Because we were showing that love. We were saved to do good deeds. And we need to do that. So we need to make sure righteousness is not what we do. And it's in our DNA, isn't it? We're British. Sorry, you're South African, you're German behind you. But you've lived here long enough, you've heard the story, isn't it? We're British, we're bound to be Christians. There was a lady two doors down from us in London wanted us to marry them. Us, me, whatever. And I said, are you a Christian? She said, of course I am. I'm a nurse. You can laugh, but that is, I'm a good person. Not only am I a good person, I'm doing a good, caring job. It's nothing to do with that. It's your relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. I'm just going to leave a couple of seconds quiet because maybe somebody in here, you've never said these words. Oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. And if that's you, I want you to come and see us at the end and pray that prayer.
to realize that it's not about all the good things that you do. It's about saying, I want Jesus in my life. And then when Jesus comes into your life, God the Father sees you through Jesus and you're righteous. You're not perfect. He's still working in you, but you're seen as, as righteous. In Jesus' name, amen. Mrs. Boyle, it's over to you. And you're welcome. <laughs> This is why Brent and I are both smiling. <laughs> I was volunteered. It's not working. I was volunteered. Aren't they nice to me? Right, I'm coming over here first. What have you guys been up to today? What have you done, Lila? We were making people to, lo to love our family. Oh, wow. So is that all the people that you've been praying for this morning? So lots and lots of different people. Who did you pray for? Um, my mum. Mummy. Who did you pray for today, Toby? Mummy. Mummy. Daddy too? No. I think that was a nod. It's all right, Richard. You're okay. Robin, how about you? Um, I prayed for Lila. You. That was lovely. Is Lila your friend? Yeah. Oh, that's yes. Really She's good. my lovely friend. She's your loveliest friend. That's amazing. How about you, Noah? Who did you pray for? Mum. Mum. Brilliant. Well done, everyone. That's fantastic. Right, I'm coming over here now. What about you guys? How about you, Luke? What did you get up to this morning? We were making stuff uh, about uh, who we love, like our friends and our families and like what we belong to. Okay, that's really cool. What about you, Ruben? What have you done? I think we were making wafts. Were you? Wow. Tell us a bit more about that then. Uh, I just made up a waff, so okay. I didn't know what I'm doing. All right. So... <laughs> Oh, just to clarify, down here we've got some emoji prayers. So they've got pictures, in case you don't know what an emoji is. looks like one of these. And there's all sorts of things that they've been praying for. So things that make them sad, people who can get better or they're ill, things that they want to say thank you for, some things that they might feel angry about, and things that they want to help people for. So that's fantastic, isn't it? Um, I'm looking at Josh because I volunteered him as well to come and tell us what the old ones have been doing. So in the youth today, we were talking about how actions are going to be used through faith. So one of our examples was not just coming to church on a Sunday, but going out during the week and then pursuing what God would want us to do out in the week. I also thought all the children down here have been really, really good because they've had to remember what they've done and share it with us. So I thought we could maybe remember what we've done and share it with them. So I picked on Clive. <laughs> we've been learning from, from Bob about the order in which we can come to know more about Jesus. And first of all, he calls us to belong, that we can all be part of his family. We can invite in people who are not part of the church today, and they can belong, they can become part of this family. Through that, we can come to believe in God, believe in Jesus, and trust Jesus, and find that new life in Jesus. And that will then change the way we live our lives, we will work out the way we uh, behave to do the things that God would want us to do. Not because that's how we are justified, but because that's what we do because of his love for us. That shapes us. 
I'm impressed. Well done, Clive. <laughs> <laughs> So Clive stayed awake through the service anyway, which is good. So um, we're going to stand and sing one more song. We've just got a couple of small notices. There are cakes for sale at the back um, for the food bank, I believe. Um, and also, people may have noticed that the bungalow next door, they've had their curb dropped, so we need to be mindful that they're now, that's their, um, their access, and we need to allow for, make sure we don't park in front of their, uh, their access to their property as well, please. Just... Just somebody to observe that earlier on. So, shall we stand and sing one more song? Just uh, some of you, hopefully most of you know, but Tundi's mum died very, quite suddenly last week, and so the funeral is on Tuesday. So can we just pray for, for Tundi, Thomas and, and Chris, and, and Tundi's brother. Father, we uh, just pray that the peace that passes all understanding will just remain with Tundi, her brother, and Thomas and Chris, and the rest of the family there in Romania. I just pray that in one sense it'll be a good funeral, that uh, your name will be glorified,
Democrats, I think, will be working mainly with uh, relief with the uh, the Romanis in the in the town. That's where most of the churches outreach is. So I'll be praying for that. And also, there's a lady in the back. Sorry, could everybody sit down and Annette, wave your hand. Uh, just welcome Marie's mum. She's come over. She's making. what mums do. We know why you're here. You're here to check up on us. We know that. Hopefully we will take care of your beautiful daughter. And uh, what Christmas Day? Just to say if you are on your own on Christmas Day or you haven't got anywhere to go for, for lunch, we will be providing it here. So you just need to give your name to me, please. 